Shahar, lecturer in psychology. Positive psychology essentially focuses on what works. So it applies to research. Most uh, research in psychology looks at schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, whereas positive psychology says let's look at the things that work in life. Let's look at love, let's look at happiness, let's look at joy, job satisfaction, and so on. Um, positive psychology also focuses on what works when it comes to practice. Um, so for instance, a therapist, the first implicit or explicit question that he or she would ask the client would be, what's wrong? What's not working in your life? Uh, a positive psychologist would first ask, what is working? What is going well in your life? and then build on that, and then deal with what is not working based on what is working. Uh, same in organizations. Uh, a consultant would usually ask, uh, what's the problem in the organization? What do we need to improve? A positive psychologist coming in to a company would first ask, what is working well in the organization? What are the company's strengths? What are the virtues? And then build on that. The earliest pioneer of positive psychology was probably Aristotle, who talked about uh, eudaimonia or flourishing. Um, more recently, um, the first time it was explicitly mentioned in literature was by uh, Abraham Maslow, who in 1954 wrote a chapter on uh, toward a positive psychology. And then the, the father of positive psychology more recently is uh, Marty Seligman, from the University of Pennsylvania, who in 1998, when he was the um, president of the American Psychological Association, um, essentially founded uh, the field, creating a network of scholars that would focus, that would research uh, what works. I don't think it's realistic that everyone goes to a positive psychologist, nor do I think it's necessary. I do, uh, however, recommend that uh, all people uh, learn about this field because there is some fascinating research uh, being done in this area that can help uh, people become happier, that can help them improve their relationship, that can aid them in, uh, in, in raising healthier, happier, flourishing children. What research has shown recently is that when we focus on people's strengths, when we cultivate their happiness, um, we're actually indirectly also helping them deal with uh, hardships and difficulties. So it's not necessary to go to dealing with anxiety directly. We can focus on strength and that will indirectly help people deal with anxiety. We don't need to directly go to uh, problematic areas within relationships. It's when we cultivate the positive in a relationship that inadvertently, indirectly, um, also the, the negatives fall by the wayside. So positive psychology helps directly becoming happier and also indirectly in helping us overcome, helping us deal with uh, difficulties and hardships. I most certainly see my books, my writing, my teaching as self-help, self-help in the traditional sense. Um, self-help was, to a great extent, about applying yourself, about cultivating character, about working hard. Uh, toward self-cultivation, toward more success and well-being. And this is what I attempt to do through my teachings. I believe that taking responsibility for one's life, for one's happiness, is, is critical. It's critical at any time. It's especially important uh, during difficult times. And the misunderstanding that many people have about um, happiness and joy is that it can come somehow from the outside, whereas more and more research, more and more experiences suggest that it can only come from within. In other words, we need to help ourselves. Many of the self-help books today offer quick fixes, so the five steps to happiness, the three things you need to do in order to become uh, the great uh, partner or leader, you know, the one secret of uh, life flourishing and, uh, and success. And this is over-promising and under-delivering. Uh, there is no quick fix, or at least I haven't found the quick fix. And um, improving, growing, flourishing is, is about hard work. So some of the stigma 
that's associated with the self-help literature today. Some of it, not all, uh, is, um, is well deserved. The classic self-help book is by Samuel Smiles, a 19th century uh, British writer who wrote a book called Self-Help. And this is about uh, hard work. It's about cultivating your character. Um, more recently, uh, very good self-help books that have been written would be um, Stephen Covey's The, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, Marty Seligman's book on um, learned optimism, Alan Langer books on, um, on mindfulness, and so on. And it's mostly today books written by, by academics who, who do rigorous research or rely on empirical evidence. I don't think it's the highest thing that any human can achieve, but I think it's something that we all strive for uh, by virtue of our nature, whether we want to or not. We can call it run away from pain and, and pursue pleasure. Um, we can call it uh, a sense of meaning, but all these elements eventually uh, lead up to happiness. We're so constituted that we pursue happiness. It's no coincidence that the founding fathers um, put the pursuit of happiness as one of the uh, self-evident rights. It's part of our nature. There is certainly a place and an important place for, for painful emotions. So for example, one of the, the trends today, one of the quick fixes is trying to medicate away uh, every painful emotion uh, that we or, or our children, students uh, may have. And I think this hurts uh, individuals. I think it hurts uh, our society as a whole. Painful emotions uh, can lead to, to important learning. Painful emotions can lead to growth. Failure uh, can lead to important learning and growth. And, and that should be, ought to be, uh, usually is part and parcel of, of any life and certainly a successful life. In fact, there's a lot of research showing that um, the most successful people in the world, whether it's scientists or artists, are also the people who have failed uh, the most times. It shows that ultimately the happiest people are actually people who allow themselves to experience the full gamut of human emotions, not people who suppress uh, or somehow get rid of painful emotions when, when these arise. Also, painful emotions at times lead us to, to creativity. While there is research showing that we tend to be more creative when we're in a positive mood and we turn, tend to be uh, more passive when in a negative mood, um, we can also be highly creative, and there are many examples of highly creative people uh, who were depressed or anxious and generally unhappy. Being human is about having the, the whole range, the full range of emotions. What psychologists have shown is that material affluence uh, is not correlated with happiness except for in extreme cases. So if a person's basic needs are not met, food, shelter, basic education, then that certainly um, affects their levels of happiness. If someone doesn't have uh, individual freedoms under a dictatorship, um, then that person's happiness will certainly be influenced. So there are certain things that society can do, mostly by, by giving freedom, by allowing people to, to pursue uh, their happiness. You know, the Declaration of Independence doesn't say that we have the right to happiness. It says that we have the right to pursue happiness. And um, that's a, a very smart political as well as psychological statement. I think that generally there is a, a problem with, with being out there all the time. We, we also need our... Um, bits of solitude. Some people, you know, the introverts need it more than others, the, the extroverts, uh, but we all need it and, and it's important to have a, a private life by externalizing everything that, that we do and we think about, um, I think we're hurting some of our potential for, for growth. We learn, we grow, we develop when, when we're reflecting, reflecting and when we are reflecting without thinking about how this is going to look on, on Facebook or Twitter or on our blog. So I think there is place for, for privacy, which we are to some extent losing. Having said that, there is also uh, much benefit with, uh, with being with the social networks, with being more in touch with other people, you know, meeting uh, uh, 
uh, someone you went to school with in third grade thanks to Facebook. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. What many people think is that the problem lies with having too high expectations. So if we lower our expectations, we will not be disappointed, hence we'll be happier. The problem, though, as a lot of research suggests, is not with high expectations versus low expectations. The issue is wrong expectations versus right expectations. Many people have the expectation that getting that next raise or buying that bigger car or getting the, the promotion um, will, will make them happier. Where, in fact, it does lead to more happiness, but only um, for the short term. Only, there's only a spike in one's base level of well-being. So people who have these expectations that the achievement of the external will make them happier will inevitably be disappointed, unhappy. Um, the issue is having the right expectations. If our expectations are that more time with our family and friends, being more physically active, being more grateful um, for what we do and what we have, if our expectations are that these things will make us happier, then we have the right expectations and we will in fact become happier. The first thing to do to become happier paradoxically is to accept painful emotions, to accept them as part and parcel of, of, of being alive. You know, there are, there are two kinds of people who don't experience painful emotions, such as anxiety or, or disappointment, sadness, envy, two kinds of people who don't experience these painful emotions. They are the psychopaths and the dead. So if we experience painful emotions at time, it's actually a good sign. It means that we're not a psychopath and we're alive. And the paradox is that when we give ourselves the permission to be human, the permission to experience the full gamut of human emotion, we open ourselves up to positive emotions as well. The number one predictor of well-being, of happiness, is time, quality time we spend with our family, friends, people we care about and who care about us. And in our modern world, unfortunately, this quality time is eroding. Uh, a very, very good predictor of well-being is what uh, psychologist Tim Kasser calls time affluence. Time affluence is the feeling that we have time to sit down and chat with our friends while not while being on the phone at the same time or, or, or text messaging at the same time, being with that person. This is a better predictor. Physical exercise contributes a great deal to happiness. In fact, there is research showing that regular exercise three times a week for 30 to 40 minutes of aerobic exercise could be jogging or walking or aerobics or dancing three times a week of 30 to 40 minutes of exercise is equivalent to some of our most powerful psychiatric drugs in dealing with depression or sadness or anxiety. We've become a, a sedentary uh, culture where um, you know, we park our car next to our workplace or take the train and uh, we, don't, we don't walk like our foreparents used to. You know, thousands of years ago, the, um, our foreparents walked an average of uh, eight miles a day. How far do we walk today? Well, it depends where we park our car. And uh, we pay a high price for it because we weren't made to be sedentary. We were made to be uh, physically active. There are treasures of happiness all around us and within us. The problem is that we only appreciate them when, when something terrible happens. You know, usually when um, we become sick, we appreciate our health. When we lose someone dear to us, we appreciate our life and we don't need to wait. If we cultivate the habit of gratitude, uh, we can significantly increase our levels of happiness. So for example, research by Robert Emmons and Mike McAuliffe shows that people who keep a gratitude journal, who each night before going to sleep write at least five things for which they're grateful, big things or little things, uh, are happier, more optimistic, more successful, more likely to achieve their goals, physically healthier, it actually strengthens our immune system, and are more generous and benevolent toward others. This is an intervention that takes three minutes a day with um, significant positive ramifications. One of the most important things that we can do in our modern world is to simplify 
to do less rather than more. The problem is that we try and cram more and more things into less and less time and we pay a price. We pay a price in terms of the quality of the work um, that we do. We also pay a price in terms of the quality of relationships that we enjoy. So doing less, such for example, uh, switching uh, our phone off for three hours when we get home or not responding to every email as it arrives, having what I call email free zones. Um, these little things, simplifying our lives even slightly, can make a significant difference to our productivity as well as uh, happiness. It's very difficult to talk about or think about happiness when one has experienced tragedy. Um, in fact, when people actually break down, when they give themselves the permission to be human, whether it's by crying or sharing uh, their emotions with others, when they break down, they're actually much more likely to get over their tragedy. Whereas people who say, okay, I'm going to pull through this, I'm going to be strong, I'm not going to let these emotions uh, take over me, they're actually people who would struggle for much longer periods of time uh, after the tragedy has occurred. We need to give our uh, mind, our body, our emotions uh, time to heal. And it's, that's when the, the natural healer kicks in when we let it take its course rather than suppress it. Many people talk about um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is quite common whether uh, after 9-11 or people coming back from Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, however, very few people talk about post-traumatic growth, which potentially is, is more common than, um, than PTSD. Post-traumatic growth comes about when we give ourselves the permission to be human, when we allow ourselves to experience the emotions. It comes when we interpret or reinterpret the event and, and look for, actively look for a meaning in what had just happened to us. Um, it comes when we share our experiences, when we open up rather than um, close down. So it is possible to experience post-traumatic growth. It's possible for many more people who have gone through trauma, who have gone through difficult experiences, um, to experience growth as, as a result. And this is the power of positive psychology, of, of research, because what psychologists know today is what we can do, what we can actively do to, to experience uh, more growth following hardship. There is actually very interesting research uh, about luck by uh, Richard Weissman, who's a, a British psychologist. And what he shows is that there are actually certain characteristics that can be learned and can be taught associated with, uh, with lucky people. So it's things like um, um, being more open to opportunities, um, little things like trying new things, whether it's uh, walking back home using a different uh, route every day, uh, or varying one's, uh, one's menu, and it's also people who believe in luck who end up uh, having more luck. So he created a luck school, teaching people uh, how to become luckier, and it works. The ultimate currency is happiness. It's the end toward which all others... Um, the ultimate currency is happiness. It's the end in the words of Aristotle, toward which all other goals lead. Um, why do we want to be successful? Because we believe that it will make us happier. Why do we want more money? Because we believe that it would make us happier. And if working hard at a certain profession or certain area um, does not make us happier, but it will make us more successful, then, then why bother? I mean, ideally, what we want to find is something that is personally meaningful to us, something that we experience as pleasurable, and then pursue it. And then we can have the best of both worlds. We can be as successful as well as happy. But the key to that is to also enjoy the, the process, the journey toward this, that success, because success in and of itself um, cannot, will not make us happier. What corporations, certainly in the 21st century, uh, need to come to, to terms with is the fact that happiness pays, meaning positive emotions actually lead to more creativity, they lead to more motivation, um, and they lead to more loyalty uh, for the, the workplace. 
And in the 21st century, an organization that um, is not creative, that does not have innovation as one of its basic pillars, uh, cannot thrive in the long haul. The first thing that an organization needs to do is to give space, place for people to fail. Now, it shouldn't give um, a blank check to failure, but it needs to identify the areas where failure is not uh, traumatic or terrible and give space in these areas because that's where people learn, that's where people explore. An organization where people are afraid of failing every step of the way will not be an innovative organization. Um, second, an, an organization needs to also consider uh, giving people recovery space. It's no coincidence that we get some of our best ideas in the shower. We used to get it in the car before the cell phone came on, on the scene. And um, it's because people have the time uh, to take a step back and to, and to think about certain issues uh, to, for ideas to, to marinate. And, and, and this is necessary. That's part of creativity. It's no coincidence that the word um, creation and recreation are etymologically linked uh, because we need to recreate if we want to create. Um, organizations need to encourage their employees uh, to take recovery times, whether it's the 15 minutes every uh, 90 minutes or so, whether it's the gym uh, in the middle of the day, um, whether it's the day or two off, um, not while being connected to the computer and cell phone, whether it's the, the, the vacation, where one is really on vacation, uh, on, on holiday. And these recovery periods in the long term actually contribute to creativity, productivity, as well as happiness. Optimal love is about continuous growth within the relationship. It's about the partners becoming more intimate. It's about the partners finding more and more um, meaning um, in the relationship. It's about uh, developing. It's about ups and downs with the general trajectory uh, being upward. One of the major illusions is that healthy love, healthy relationship is devoid of conflict. Whereas in fact what we see when we study uh, the best relationships is that um, conflict is part and parcel of a healthy relationship. In fact, when there is no conflict, it's a sign that the partners are suppressing, that they are ignoring things, and it's usually a prescription for failure. At the same time, when we only have conflict or primarily conflict, that's also a bad sign. What we want to see in, in relationships is um, a positive ratio uh, between positive experiences and, and, and negative experiences. So to have more uh, more love, more joy, more celebration, and at the same time, a little bit of fighting and bickering um, can only help. The psychologist David Schnark talks about gridlocks within relationships. Gridlocks are um, points that we get to in every long-lasting relationship, gets to where um, we're stuck, where we disagree about certain things uh, that are fundamental to the relationship, and many people view these gridlocks as um, signaling the end, um, the necessary end of a relationship, when in fact, as David Schnock points out, these can very often be um, the genesis of growth, the beginning of, of a deeper relationship. So it's important to remind ourselves that very often, not always, but very often, gridlocks, uh, fights, conflicts are points for potential growth if we work through them, if we honestly and openly uh, grow through them. Education, that's our future. This is where I'm putting uh, most of my time into thinking about how we can introduce, uh, whether it's in the public school system or in the private schools, um, better teaching, um, how we can cultivate more well-being, um, more uh, of a sense of purpose because many students are experiencing um, what Viktor Frankl called an existential vacuum, uh, meaninglessness. So how to introduce a sense of purpose, how to introduce more, more happiness, and these things are of course related, uh, how to introduce uh, uh, more ambition and more flourishing in the general sense of the word into, into schools. 
I think we should introduce a happiness curriculum from uh, um, kindergarten all the way up to the age of 120. Why? Because happiness is, uh, is a journey. The earlier we start, the better. However, also if we start at a, at a late stage, we can still uh, teach a lot, we can still learn a lot. The best advice that I got was from my philosophy teacher, Ohad Kamin. After graduating from college and, and feeling very lost, um, I went to him and his advice was, Tal, think about the things that you want to do and write them down. Then look at these things and identify the things that you really want to do and write these down. And from those things, identify the things that you really, really want to do and then go ahead and do it. You know, life is short, we don't have that much time, and it's, it's too short to do uh, what we feel that we have to do. It's barely long enough to do what we want to do. It's very difficult for me to answer this question about worst mistake, especially um, after having written a book about the importance of mistakes. So I can only think of best mistakes um, that I've made, you know, mistakes that I've, that, I've, that I've learned from. And it could be mistakes in terms of uh, taking on uh, too many things, saying yes to too many things instead of uh, simplifying uh, my life. It could be the mistakes of doing things that um, were for the sake of um, getting uh, accolades as opposed to things that were uh, self-determined, that came from within, things that, that really, uh, that I was passionate about. Um, or um, the mistakes of um, not being um, not not being nice enough to people in authority, and I've very often uh, paid a price for that. One of the mantras that I repeat over and over again to myself, to my students, is learn to fail or fail to learn. One of the things that I tell my students about halfway through the class, when it's too, too late to drop the class, um, and um, they've already gotten to know me a little bit better, I tell them that I wish them that they fail more. And I truly, sincerely mean it because it's only through failure that we can learn. No, it's not true. Um, it's through failure um, that we can um, enjoy deep learning. Uh, it's through failure that we become uh, more resilient and stronger. And if you look at the life of any successful person, they've always had um, major as well as minor failures. Thomas Edison has patented 1,093 inventions, more than any other um, scientist inventor in history. He's also the scientist, as far as we know, who has failed the most times. In fact, when he was working on one of his inventions, a battery, um, a, a journalist came over and said to him, uh, you know, Edison, you have failed um, 1,000 times. You know, give it up. To which he responded, I haven't failed five. Um, when Edison was working on, on a battery, one of his inventions, um, an interviewer came over and, and said to him uh, in, in, the, in the interview, Edison, you have failed a thousand times, um, give it up. To which Edison responded, I haven't failed a thousand times, I've succeeded a thousand times, I've succeeded in showing what doesn't work. Uh, Edison also famously said, I failed my way to success. Mm -hmm.